Well, it looks like it's looks like it's one o'clock, and uh, we'll go ahead. It looks like we've got seventy eight folks joining us today so far. So hopefully, we'll have a few more as we move further along. Uh, welcome, welcome to Forest Her North Carolina. Are enjoying your woods series. Uh, this workshop today, or this meeting today, is a second work, uh, second meeting of our Enjoying Your Woods workshop. So we're glad to have you back. Glad to have you join us today. Uh, if you're new to Forest Herb, uh, just a reminder of kind of who we are. We are a, a collaborative group of state and federal agencies and nonprofit groups that uh, work together for the purpose of providing educational opportunities for women landowners about forest stewardship. And I guess I forgot to turn my camera on. So hi, it's me, Jennifer Roach. Uh, I'm a district forester with the North Carolina Forest Service. And um, welcome you all. Forget there's so many buttons here. Uh, was just talking about if you're new to Forester, we just want to welcome you to Forester. If you've never heard of us or if this is the first opportunity you've had to hear some of our speakers, that's great. We'd love to have you. And uh, we've got two great speakers on board today. Um, if you're joining us, we would love for you to type in the chat box if this is your first Forest Her event, uh, just yes or no. Uh, also, you can uh, just send us a chat of where you're joining us from today, uh, what county you're coming from, Piedmont, Coastal Plain, mountain areas. Um, it's very hard for us to, to talk through our virtual series, so uh, the chat boxes are the best that we can do for right now. Uh, if you're not familiar with the chat box, well, we've got Bob Barden with the North Carolina Forest Extension Program, and uh, he's kind of going to go over some housekeeping for us. So, Bob? Hello, everybody. Uh, Jennifer, I think you got another slide for me to use, right? So, there we go. There we go. So, <laughs> yep. For, so, for some of you, you've done this before, but let's just uh, remind everybody and those that are new, this might be a, a new experience for you. We're going to help you with a little bit of the logistics side of the house. Um, as uh, Jennifer noted, uh, feel free to use the chat box. Uh, it's pretty much like sending a text message to us. Uh, we will be monitoring that. And if you're having issues, um, if something's going on uh, technology-wise, or um, if the presenters might ask you to chime in on a, a question or something, uh, we'll ask that you do that through the chat box. If you got questions for today's speakers, we ask that you actually type those into the Q&A feature of Zoom. All you have to do is click on the Q&A button, uh, the icon. It should be uh, at the bottom of your screen, most likely, if you're on a computer. It might be in a different spot if you're on a tablet or a smartphone. Um, go ahead and type your questions in there and we will get to those um, at the appropriate time within the presentation. Uh, today's session is being closed captioning. And if you need that feature, feel free uh, to turn on closed captioning so that you can follow along with that also. Also, if you have any questions or need to get our attention for some reason, there is the, the raise hand feature. And our presenters might also ask you to raise your hand related to the topic if they have a question. And it's uh, pretty simple. It's just a little hand there. You'll see it. Uh, you can click on it and we'll be able to see who, who's done that. So thanks, everybody. And sit back and enjoy. Uh, this should be a good webinar. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. All right. Looks like we've got folks from across the state joining us today. You can read that in your chat box from Green County to Nantahala in the mountains, Bowie's Creek, Granville County. Yeah, that's where I'm coming from today with my, my daughter's headphones on today. Um, but uh, it's great. Looks like we've got a, a group that is very well representative across the state of North Carolina. So we're glad to have you here today. And we do have a few folks that are new to Forrester and joining us. So that is great as well. All right, well, here is our agenda for today. You can see that we're gonna talk about modern sustainable trails with Amanda Smithson, who is with NC State Parks. And we're also gonna talk about forest aesthetics and managing your woodlot with David Holly, who is a forest consulting, a forester, forest consultant uh, here in the Raleigh area. So we're gonna start off with Dave Holly. So if Dave, if you are out there, and want to share your screen, you can take it away. 
Hey, everybody. And then choose it. There you go. Nice. Thank so you all for your patience. Let's see, is that better? Let's there we up. go. Now we've got your presentation. All right, awesome. All right, thanks, everybody. Um, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Holly. I am a forestry consultant. I've been a consultant for 20 years. Uh, worked in Virginia for about 14 years as a service forester. So I've got a pretty broad background in forestry and lots of different forests, uh, coastal plain, Piedmont and mountains. So um, at least I hope I bring some experience and some learnings along with, with my talk. Um, when a forest landowner usually hires me, you know, one of the biggest concerns they have is, you know, I'm a little reluctant to harvest trees. I'm concerned about what it may, how it may impact uh, the aesthetics or the beauty of my forest. And so I think that's, that's critical. I think it's important. And it's probably what, sort of the niche that I've built my business around is like, how can we do this without tearing things off? I mean, is harvesting uh, disruptive? Certainly. Is, can it be done non-destructively? And I, and I certainly think there, that is possible. And I know it can be done because I do it all the time. Um, my position is that I think you, you, know, you can manage your forest and still maintain and enhance the forest beauty. I think you, that's all possible. You can have your cake and eat it too. Um, what I'd like to do in the next 30 minutes is share some ideas, tips, strategies, on how to minimize the negative impacts of actively managing your forest. And what I hope you'll find out is that, you know, these are fairly simple, practical, low cost practices that will help keep your forest beautiful. And again, in many cases, it's, it's doing a lot of little things that essentially collectively make a big difference. I need to figure out how to go to the next page, so. And I think one of the biggest things I think is so important about planning for beauty is that you have to plan for it. It's just something that doesn't happen. I think it requires you know, some upfront planning. Um, a lot of landowners, um, you know, they, they consider forest beauty higher than, or forest aesthetics higher than timber production. And I said, Dave, I don't, you know, I'm reluctant to harvest timber because it, you know, I'm gonna worry about what's gonna do to my forest. I'd much, I'm much more interested in, in, uh, in making sure my forest stays pretty. So you, a lot of you answered this question ahead of time. Um, you asked me, I asked you, I think, what, what are some of the things you don't like seeing in your forest? What do you consider unsightly, even on your forest or some of your neighbors? And a lot of you, Kind of threw out junk cars, old appliances, trash that was left on the you know on the forest floor, uh, dumped on your property. A lot of you mentioned invasive species, kudzu that was taken over part of your farm, um, multiple rows, English ivy, um, soil erosion. You didn't like soil erosion. Clear cutting harvests, especially if they were large. Um, you didn't like leftover debris, stump piles, root, root wads, large stump piles. Uh, you also mentioned you didn't like broken trees, damaged trees, trees that were damaged after, the, after a storm. Um, somebody mentioned they didn't like hardwood forests that were converted to pine, which I certainly understand. And then, you know, four wheel traffic, trespassing, things that were tearing up the woods. So yeah, when it comes to harvest, we certainly don't want things to look like this, do we? And it's probably why a lot of people are reluctant to sort of practice forestry because they've seen examples of this. Or this, nobody wants to see this on their property. I certainly don't like erosion. They hate this. Oh, this is my pet peeve. I just trash, you know, trash dumping on the property. We can talk about, we'll talk about that a little bit, but this certainly is unsightly. This is a log deck with a big, large wood pile. That's certainly nobody wants to see that. And you also told me you didn't like this. This was, you know, cars left in the woods, trash piles, dump, tire dumps, kudzu, that's kudzu, this kind of overgrown particular area. 
Now, research has shown us that, that the landowners do like certain things, you know, what, what adds to scenic beauty. And based on that survey, you guys like large, mature trees. You like, you know, mature forests. You like open forest structure that allows you to see the understory and ha have long sight views. Um, you like moderately stocked open stands compared to thick, dense stands. Um, you like tree diversity. You like to have a mixed stand of different types of species, tree species. And generally, you like natural stands over uh, pine plantations. Uh, you don't know how many landers just don't like trees planted in straight rows. You also, a lot of it, and then I meet with my clients, yes, they like their streams, they like their creeks, they like their waterways, they like them to be protected. So it's critical that uh, we protect these important features on the property. Most landowners, when I meet with, they also have special places or special trees that they really want to try to protect and maintain. And I think, you know, knowing where all those are in the initial evaluation process is very important to protecting long-term aesthetics, especially when you've got some harvesting planned in the future. So, Logging is disruptive even under the best of circumstances, but if you add these kind of things to the equation, if you add bad weather, poor soils, poor access, poor planting, it certainly can be, uh, be worse. Is timber harvesting disruptive? Certainly. Does it have to ruin the forest? No, it doesn't have to. So I've got some strategies, hopefully to make, kind of eliminate some of those negative impacts. So, these are my make them pretty harvest strategies. Uh, so if you're, you know, you're talking about having to do harvesting, if your forester determines that you need to do some harvesting, uh, here's some ideas or some concepts or some tips on how to maybe minimize the negative impacts of, uh, of removing trees, all right? Plan and utilize forest buffers, have more aesthetically pleasing clear cut. This is some tips for if you're gonna have to do some clear cuts, how can you make them prettier? Uh, for some of you, I don't know if that's possible, but I mean, th there's some ways to kind of filter that process. Some alternatives, clear cuts. I don't. I think there's some things you can do besides clear cuts that I think you need to be aware of and and can utilize in your basically what I call my forester's toolbox. Uh, forest roads building is there's some tips on that. Deck tips. A deck is actually a landing where the logging where all the materials that are cut during the harvest are brought and processed. And it usually is a concentration area that can tend to be a pretty unsightly if not taken care of. The importance of having a good contract and then the use of consultants. These are, these are kind of the summary of what I'm gonna to try to cover. All right, let's talk about uh, plant and utilize buffers. Um, here, here's, here are some of my rules. It says three buffer rules, but there's actually four. But, <laughs> but number one is, uh, you know, plan and utilize buffers. In this case, let me see if this, I've got a laser pointer here, but this is, uh, this is where we've, you know, buffer was left along the road edge. This is a three cut, three acre patch clear cut, but that buffer was, purposely left there to try to buffer this clear cut. So my buffer rules are design and plan them, make them wide, flag them and stay out of them. So let's kind of go through each one of those. First one is, is plan them, is that um, it's critical that you know you do it an on-site evaluation of the current conditions and then you sort of plan out how you're going to design your harvest. Each one of these is a different type of harvest and each of them are sort of buffered, used to buffer the road. And uh, but this planning map is critical in the design of a harvest. And this is actually a harvest legend. So this is what's presented to a logger when you arrive on the site so that he understands there's different types of treatments. I think a lot of landowners like a lot of variety in these treatments, so it's, it's critical that, that that happens. Just a quick check-in is, can everybody hear me? Uh, we can hear you just fine, Dave. Okay, great. Yes, sir. <laughs> 
All right, great. So here's 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 a timber harvest that I've planned. Again, this is a road. This is a road. Again, what I've done here is we've left That's basically cool. a buffer along this road, and then these are hard, these are these are like drainages or creek small creeks. We've buffered those as well, and we've even buffered from our neighbor. This is a neighboring property. We just think it's more neighborly to kind of leave these buffers. What we find these buffers do is they sort of not necessarily hide, but they kind of limit the impact, the negative impact. In a lot of cases, I kind of like the way it looks. If, if you look through the trees and you see the clear cut behind it, it almost looks like you know a field. So and those and those trees can help frame it and kind of buffer it and filter it to, to make it look nicer. And there's not, you know, you're not leaving a lot of value in here. I think the benefit of providing forest beauty is uh, is has has is is a good thing. This is an example of somebody that did a clear cut, but they didn't do any buffering. I mean, they just they just cut right up to the boundaries. You know, they just this was not an aesthetically designed harvest operation. The other advice I have is make your buffers pretty wide. You know, there's no sense in having real small buffers. All right, two or three buffers, or leaving just a couple of trees along a creek. This is actually a riparian forest buffer. And this was probably at least 100, 150 feet wide. The creek would be down here. And then what we did, the harvesting would be on the upper side of this thing. So there's a lot of benefits, not just aesthetically, but from a water quality standpoint and from a wildlife standpoint, especially these are great corridors for wildlife to move through. And if you're doing any kind of hunting, these are, these are ideal habitat for deer corridors. The other recommendation is that you know these need to be flagged or painted out before the timber harvest, so the, the so the, the uh, logger knows where to stop. It's critical that they you know that this is done ahead of time. This is why a consulting forester is so important, is that uh, he does all this planning and flagging ahead of time. My advice is always you know sweat during peacetime so you don't bleed during wartime, and that just means do your homework. Be uh, get all that stuff designed, planned, flagged out ahead of time. And then just stay out of them, you know. This is an area that, that was flagged off as a buffer, and then this is the area that we actually did the, 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 the shelter with harvest on. So you can see this is where we've stopped, and there's still a good little ways that goes all the way down to the creek. I, I prefer to just manage the uplands. Anybody that's been a client of mine knows that I like repairing buffers. I make them wide, and I stay out of them. Yeah. Keeps things simple. All right, let's give you some tips about clear cuts. How can you make them at least more aesthetically pleasing? I mean, there are there are some tips to make help help reduce the negative impact of a clear cut. I always say, as a forester, a clear cut is certainly has to be in your toolbox at some point in the management of your forest. That you know so you're gonna you may have to consider a final harvest to start a new and vigorous forest because because the trees have matured. Uh, or in some cases, the, the trees are inferior or in, in, uh, need to be restored. If you're going to do like a long leaf restoration, and you've got nothing but scrub oak, sometimes clear cutting is the best way to start over in, in that process. So my, I've definitely got to get my numbering down, but my, my four clear cut rules are, and here's only three, but, you know, limit their size by breaking them up, clean them up, and consider their other options to clear cuts. So one thing is just, you know, try to limit the size of clear cuts. I, I, my general rule is try to keep them below 15 acres. And if I can't keep them below 15 acres, then, then I try to use the sort of like a buffer of trees that connects or divides the clear cuts into smaller blocks. This is a fairly narrow one. I would probably prefer to see it a little bit bigger. But again, these small corridors can help break up a large clear cut. Here's an example for one of the client I did. If you look at this map, this, this blue area here is a 58 acre clear cut. But if you see these little red dots in here, what I've done is that these are reserve trees that I've marked prior to the harvest that essentially breaks this one large clear cut up into five smaller cuts. And this, this, this is a picture of that little buffer that kind of 
divides one clear cut from the other. This here foreground is the is a clear cut, and then the background starts another clear cut. Again, aesthetically, it really kind of softens the clear cut. Plus these these areas, what I I've connected them to a repairing zone, so these are nice corridors for wildlife to move back and forth. You know where they feel comfortable moving back and forth across here. So you know a deer that comes up this drainage could cross this buffer and get into that drainage. Cut them clean, this is, this is very important long-term because cut them clean gets everything a good fresh start. This is what I hate to see. I mean, this from an aesthetic standpoint, this is horrible. I mean, this is, uh, this is where a logger is probably what's called a high grade where they cut everything and, and left, you know, just trees that were unmerchable or had no value. And they just, they're just, these trees, over time will develop into larger trees, but they take a valuable growing space. So, and then, you know, in the, you know, 15 years from now, those trees will still be there, but they'll, you know, they'll be crowding out the young timber growth that's coming in, coming in. There's a way to do select cuts, but this is not the way guys or ladies. So I always say, cut them clean. If you're going to have a clear cut. And that means going back and cutting all the whips down and broken tops, even if you have to, to uh, you know, pay somebody to come in after they're done. My, my advice is to put it in the contract. My contract should just say anything over three inches in diameter at breast height um, has to be cut down before they leave, even if they don't utilize the wood. So here's my harvest strategies when it comes to clear cuts. Limit the size, try to keep it under 15. Paint your your boundaries, flag them. Uh, try to avoid scenic or uh, sensitive areas. You find out those ahead of time and kind of buffer them out. Break larger clear cuts up by using tree corridors, tree islands, or repairing buffers. Cut them clean, and then include special provisions in your contract to make sure that it's cut clean. All right. Let's talk about alternatives to clear cuts. Uh, I, I think a lot of people that think that clear cuts is the only way to go, and that's not true. There's lots of different things. And these are some examples of things, different types of techniques that you can use besides clear cut. They're certainly much more aesthetically pleasing than a clear cut, all right? Shelter wood harvest, thinning, small group openings, clear cut with reserves, strip clear cuts. There's the flame of slog, which is a, a German technique. Uh, for hardwood regeneration, especially for oak, two age system. There's, there's, what I'm saying is there's other options and that's why having a consulting forester that knows these different techniques and can implement them uh, can have a major impact on the, the aesthetics and beauty of your forest. Here's some examples. Here's an oak shelter wood. This is actually one year after harvest, believe it or not. This was a timber harvest. These trees were protected. Uh, some of the midstory was removed here. Um, and this, for most people, this is a fairly pleasant looking forest. This is an example of that same thing, but it's tech really a week after it was cut. So if you'll see what happened is, the, the, I don't know if you see the orange paint on that, but these trees were all marked prior to harvest. So the logger was instructed to go in and cut everything but what we consider these good crop trees in this shelter wood system. Oak shelter wood system is a way to regenerate oak. Um, and the only way to do that is, is to do a, a harvest that only removes about 80% of the crown, but most of the midstory so that you get the few sunlight in here to start regeneration of oak. It's critical for oak regeneration that you have use a system like this. The likelihood that oak will regenerate after a clear cut with no preparation work is zero. Oak just has no chance against yellow poplar, red maple, sweet gum. Here's a sea tree harvest. Have anybody been around Duke Forest? They do a lot of sea tree harvest. Um, has a couple different things. They, a lot of the re main reason is aesthetic. It breaks this clear cut up. You have individual mature trees. But the added benefit is these are seed trees. So they actually produce uh, the seed that will germinate underneath young pine seedlings under here. The only problem with seed trees is that, you know, you can't control the stocking. So they tend to, to get too thick and you have to kind of cut out. You have to go back, you know, and do some intermediate cutting. Group selection. This is like we just a series of small group openings. So imagine a puzzle and you just sort of take pieces of the puzzle out every five to 10 years. 
And over time, you have a mix of mature trees, young forest, and early successional habitat. Here's a thinning on a young stand. Here's a thinning on an older stand. And this, this is a hardwood thinning, an oak shelter. This is about three or four years later, so you can see the, the great oak regeneration that's coming up underneath there. All right, here's, uh, here's my rules up for truck. You have to build roads. You can do them right, or you can, you can really mess them up, and, and, uh, and it, they can be quite an eyesore for landowners and the tree farms. So if they build them, and when I say they, I mean loggers. You know, they, you know, they will build them, but not necessarily under the best conditions and not necessarily with the best equipment. Their, their mode is get in and get out as quick as they can, minimize the costs. So you, this is what a lot of what you get. You get roads that aren't well drained, they're not well designed. This is actually eight years after a logging road was put in by a logger and you just see it's just not, you know, it's not functioning well. It's, it's probably an eyesore. Now, my advice is to build them yourself, hire a contractor, do it when the conditions are good, you know, when the weather conditions are ideal, which is usually the summer, spring, you know, so it's actually ideal to build a road and let it settle for at least six to eight months. Let the rain pack it down and, and uh, make it work. Anybody's done a road building, the worst time to build, to, to actually use a road is right after you build it because it's soft and it's, it's uh, fluffy. Give it five or six different rains to pack that dirt down and you're, you're going to have a much better road. I always say rock or gravel where you need it. And then in this case, um, make sure that you'll, you know, this road is crowned, but you're going to have diversion, you know, so that the water is able to divert off the road. Here, there's a diversion here, there's a diversion there, and another one here. So stop the erosion. The other thing is dress them up and regrade them and stabilize them when they're done. This was, this was a, this is a deck here. And then now, right now, we've hired a bulldozer to come back and kind of regrade the road. Crown it, reestablish your turnouts, and in some case, gravel it. I, I usually like to gravel some sections, especially if you're going to use it. Roads don't have to be ugly, is my advice, but in order to do that, you have to design them well. And you have to do it ahead of time, and I would suggest you do it yourself. The other thing is gate them, keep traffic out, because if you don't gate them, you're going to have this problem. People are going to come in, they're going to dump. Without a gate, you've given them almost, in a lot of cases, permission to just come in there and dump it. So gating is controlling access is important. If you have illegal dumping, I, you know, you could, I could spend a whole course on that, but it's just, you need to do a little investigating. This gentleman here is investigating. You'd be ashamed, you'd be amazed how much information somebody will leave behind in trash. I've seen pay stubs, I've seen, you know, med you know medical bills. You can pretty much figure out who's done it. You can contact the sheriff and get them to clean it up for you. All right. So there's kind of my road strategies. Plan and build them. You know, when you, you know, you do them, avoid doing them in wet weather. Allow roads to settle before using them. Build them to handle storm water, rock and gravel as needed. Fix them up when they're done. Put good gates in there. The other thing is have good, good language, which we'll talk about. All right, five deck rules. A deck is actually the concentration area. That means, you know, where the, where the wood is gonna come in, this is where it's processed. This can be the ugliest part of the logging operation. My advice is hide them, limit the size, avoid large deck piles and clean them up. So again, try to hide your decks, try to get them off the road, not right on the road. Try to keep their size fairly small. This is a deck pile, try to avoid this. Sometimes my, my, my contract language you know, tells them to put this somewhere else or hide this somewhere else except the, instead of the deck, deck pile. In this case, I, well, a lot of times is I'll design a boneyard. I'll have a designated area in the farm where they can take this log and slash. And it's usually out of the way and you know, it's usually over a hill, out of sight. And in some cases, we've actually hired dump trucks to bring it and dump, dump some of that material away from the deck. The other advantage of a uh, thing to use is a whole tree chipper. Some loggers have a whole tree chipper that can actually chip up a lot of that debris so that you, you won't see it. But it makes a much cleaner operation and it's much more aesthetically pleasing. The other thing is clean up your deck. I've used a mulcher in the past to mulch the deck. 
There's one in progress. This was a deck, just mulch it down and then usually seed it. You know, we seeded this deck. This was a logging deck. You can use wildflowers. And I'd say use them. I mean, a lot of times they can be uh, food plots, picnic areas. So those are my strategies, you know, plan them in advance where they're gonna be, try to get them off the road or hidden, limit their size, create a boneyard, um, maybe contract with the whole tree chipper if logging slash is an issue, clean them up when you're done, have special contract provisions that, that make sure that all that type of work is done, seed and vegetate them and hopefully use them in the future. All right, let's talk quickly about timber contracts. Um, I think they're critical and it's one of the main reasons you should hire a consultant so that you have language in your contracts that help protect the aesthetics of your farm. You know, especially when it comes to roads, I always, you know, there's always a condition there is that they're in a good or better shape than you found them. All the more reason to build a road good so that when it's done, it's gonna be as good or better than they, they left. The other thing is just what I call stop and go is I think your contract needs to say that, you know, you have to, get permission to move on to the site. And if, if logging conditions get bad, which means super wet weather, that the consultant or the landowner have the ability to stop the operation, at least temporarily, until conditions improve. There's nothing worse on soil conditions than logging during wet, saturated weather conditions. I always require a meeting that, you know, you meet on site with the logger at the beginning of the operation, you do a walk around, you show them the buffers, you show them the conditions, go over the conditions of the sale. You talk about logging debris. If you've got a boneyard designated, I think it's important that the logger knows where that wood needs to go. And it, it doesn't need, you don't know, want it to accumulate in big, large piles on the deck. Uh, the other provision I have in clear cut situations that I have is that every, any tree over three inches in diameter at four and a half feet needs to be cut down. Or you know, if it's not utilized, they need to cut it down because we want to get a young, you know, we want to get full sunlight to the ground for the new, new forest to start. We re review the buffer rules. It's usually a flagging rule. If you see red flagging, you stop. If you see a orange painted tree, that means don't cut it, don't skin it up. Maps, we make sure that they get plenty of maps that show them all the different areas. That, you know, they might designate, hey, there, here's a small cemetery you need to avoid. Here's a, you know, a, a particular important tree that we're trying to stay away from. All right, my biggest thing, and, and this is, I hate this is self-serving, but I really think one of the biggest benefits of trying to address forest beauty is to, is to hire, hire somebody to help you out. And I always think we're sort of the architects of the whole forest management process. We're there to help you evaluate what you got, to develop a harvesting um, plan for you, and then design it so that it's not disrupted. It doesn't have disruptive effects, or how do you do it to minimize it? And that just means, there's certain steps that need to be taken. You know, the consultant takes on to make sure that happens. First of all, you know, he, he you know he, he recommends the harvest strategy. It might not be clear cut. Maybe it's a shelter wood. Maybe it's a seed tree. But you know, he can give you the advice on what's going to work for your particular property. He'll flag out the buffers for you. He'll paint the boundaries. He'll make sure that you're on your property, not off your property, which is critical. He'll mark the trees to save or to cut which is important. So it's nice to have a professional forest walk through the woods, selecting the best trees to keep, not the worst trees. He, you know, he helps you identify scenic areas and make sure that adequate buffers are put around. He'll help you develop a contract that has these specific conditions. He'll develop a timber harvest map that you know, everybody will see and share and go by. The other thing he does is he'll just be on site. He will be there looking at the logging site, making sure things are done well. If something's not being done, you know, he'll have it corrected. If it's too wet, he'll tell the loggers it's time to stop and go home and come back, you know, when it's ready to do. That logging oversight is critical. And, you know, he's going to be on him about picking up trash. He's going to be on him about, you know, moving slash around and distributing slash. So. So he enforces a contract. He's the kind of the heavy. So it sort of takes you out of the equation. He also is going to come up with a regeneration plan. All right, what are you going to do after you're done? And then, you know, he helps you with all the clothes out. He makes sure the loggers cleans up the law, the roads, he's, the roads are seated. 
the entrances are, are regated or locked again so that we can keep people from getting back in. For those that you need a consultant, uh, probably the best resource is I think the Association Consulting Forester, it's a plug for them. This is kind of the, the I, I call the, uh, the gold standard for consultants in North Carolina. If you can go to their website, they actually have a find a forester link. And if you click on, you know, if you look down here, if you click on the county you live on, then this will pop up. So then you'll have all the foresters that work in that county and, uh, and how to get a hold of them. All right, this is my contact information. All right, I'll open it up for questions <laughs> or are we gonna wait till later and tell me Bob? So uh, yes, Dave, so we do have several questions. Uh, so we'll start with the first one. We'll kind of go backwards. Um, what is the deck pile used for? What is the what? The deck pile used for. Well, the, the deck pile deck. is not used for anything. It's just, it's when, when a logger logs trees, there's certain portions of the tree he can't use. Sometimes it's a butt swell. It might be a fence, you know, wires going through it or it's, it's hollow. So a lot of times he'll cut that bottom of the tree off and he'll throw it in a pile. And, uh, and he only utilizes the, the wood that has clean wood in it. So th they tend to be, you know, there's not much use for those types of trees, but if you're doing any kind of harvesting in, in large, you know, large diameter trees, especially hardwoods, you, that pile can kind of get kind of big after a while. Okay, thanks. Um, are forestry B and P's uh, required? Uh, when putting in roads, and what is the best way to ensure those BMPs are being followed? Well, they're they're not they're voluntary as long as it's you know if, if it's a forced civil culture operation if it's you know roads uh, are not required to be permitted, but uh, they're voluntary as long as you follow best management practices and that there are a set of guidelines that the North Carolina Forest Service have put together on how to design and build roads. So as long as you build those roads with that guidance, then, then you're in good shape. Okay, so we've got another one um, and we may need some clarification for Lynn. Uh, it looks like she's maybe concerned about a 70 to 90 year old uh, poplar sweet gum hickory oak uh, beach forest stand. Um, and maybe she's con uh, concerned about maybe some species taking over, maybe more beach coming in, maybe how you could control some of that beach, American beach. Yeah, I mean, uh, America, I mean, what, what your forest is probably going through is it's just going through succession. Is it, and beach is usually a late, what we call late succession tree. It comes in after a forest has usually been established because it's super shade tall and it likes the shade of other trees. So a lot of times you'll see beech come underneath an existing hardwood forest. So um, I don't, you know, I wouldn't want you to control it. I just want you to manage what you've got there. I mean, it's 70 year old stand. It's still fairly, fairly young hardwood stand. You know, most hardwood stands can grow at least to 120, 130 if managed correctly. So I, I wouldn't worry about beech. I'd say, you know, it's nice to keep a mix now, on some of my Oakland sites, I actually like to push beach back down into the under, back, back down to the riparian zones, those shaded areas. If I manage them for oak, then I, I actually try to cut as much of the beach out of an, a shelter wood system if they're on a ridge top. Okay, great. Um, so the next one is from Robin, who uh, had some land timbered about 20 years ago. And it looks like she's got uh, a forest of small small dense pines. So how would you suggest handling this uh, overstocked stand? Hire consultants <laughs> to come look at it. I mean, it, it depends on what's growing up there. I think you really need to evaluate if you've cut it, what's growing back. You may have some really nice trees in there. It just, it may take some time for it. mother nature to sort it out. There are some intermediate practices that you can do to help improve the growing space around really good trees. There's a, a crop tree release practice that's usually done in pole size stands where you try to release individual trees from its neighbor by, by cutting the trees that touch that tree's crown so that you can make sure that tree becomes one of the dominant trees in the forest. So, but there's different techniques. The biggest thing sometimes is just let it grow. Um, 
and then you know look at some intermediate practices to help improve what you would really like to see in there you know you don't want to see it all in sweet gum or our beach maybe you'd like to make sure that there are 15 or 20 red oaks and white oaks come up in that and in order to do that you have to favor them at some point with a with a treatment but i think a for hiring a forester to evaluate that that situation will let you know what you have and what options you have Okay, great, thanks. Uh, we've got a, a, another question from Ricky. Uh, looks like he's just ultimately has some questions about surveying. So when the land is being surveyed, what should a landowner maybe expect to happen? Maybe they're surveying their own property or the neighbor is surveying their property and uh, the trees that a surveyor will tend to cut to establish that line. Do you have any tips yeah. for a landowner? Um. Believe it or not, I mean, a survey is a, is a great thing. If your neighbor doing it, it's awesome because it's not cheap. You know, I think it's usually $1,200 a day, but it's it, establishing those lines is critical. And so if he has to cut trees away to be able to see a neat, nice, clear line of view, then that's that's will be OK. Um, you, rarely do they cut very large trees. If anything, they're just cutting down a path so they can you know put the rods up and make, make measurements. Um, then they also flag it. My biggest advice for line landowners have, are either doing a survey or had a you know have a neighbor's done a survey is that once it's been flagged that they should paint those lines. They should scrape a little bit of bark off the tree and then paint you know well defined uh, with you know an oil based paint so that those, those that boundary is well defined. Um, flagging tends to be moved, tends to dry up and fall off. So if you're going to go to that expense, either your neighbor or yourself, then uh, I think it's important that you paint those boundary lines or have the surveyor do it at an extra cost. The ultimate thing is just get together with your neighbors and talk, you know, let's talk about this boundary. You know, it's good, good boundary lines make good neighbors is the general rule. Okay, great. Um, looks like maybe we'll have uh, time for maybe two more questions. So the next one is, what is the average cost for a consulting forester to plan and oversee a harvest? And how would you go about finding a reputable logger? Um, okay, a couple questions in there. Um, finding a reputable logger, again, that's, that's the uh, kind of the job of the consultant to help you invite loggers that he thinks will do a good job. It depends on the type of harvest you're going to do, but I think it's critical that a consultant knows the loggers. He's worked with, you know, I've been here 20 years. I've worked with a bunch of them. There's some I really like, some I don't like, some I'll never ask to come back again. So, I mean, that's that's a knowledge base that most private landowners don't have. Um, I've even, you know, even on like a lump sum bid where you've got a high bid, you've, you've got a logger you don't particularly like, but as long as you hold his feet to the fire, in a lot of cases, they'll do what you need. So that's critical. What was the other question? Of, uh, the beginning of that question. Uh, just what was the average cost for a consulting for? Oh, average cost for a consultant. Consultants work, everyone is different, but there's different kinds of fee structures when it comes to a timber sale. Um, one is just a straight hourly rate. I will charge you an hourly rate for this work, or they'll, they'll, they'll charge a commission, which is basically uh, a percentage of the gross timber proceeds. And that, you know, that runs anywhere from, you know, six to, to 12% dependent on the, the complexity of the job. And there's added costs to timber sales too that I think, you know, if you're gonna do some marking, some uh, consultants will charge for the marking costs and then a commission. Okay, great. Uh, so this is the last question, Dave, and then yes. we'll move on. Um, so what are the rules about managing riparian buffers? And can someone go back into a dry creek and clean up the brush? that was left from a logging operation? Well, most of the time you don't want brush left. If there's a stream crossing, it has to be cleaned out. That's a BMP. And in fact, it's probably a forest practice act. You know, you cannot block the stream, you, you know, from a logging operation. So that's critical that, you know, that's, again, another thing a consultant can make sure it happens. Or if you're doing it on your own, you know, make sure that's cleaned out. Um, there are buffer rules. Uh, they're, they're quite varied. B, there's BMP rules and then there's buffer rules, um, but they're fairly lenient and, and they're fairly complicated. 
um, you know, there's different zones that you can do different things in all the way up to, you know, to the edge of the creek. In fact, in some cases, they'll even allow the removal of, you know, large diameter trees as long as they don't have exposed roots in the, in the creek bed. Um, all I can say is it's, it's, it's complicated. That's kind of why as me as a consultant, when it comes to repairing zones, I like to mark, mark them wide and I don't allow anything, anybody to go in them. You know, just, it keeps it simple. Then I don't have any issues with the creeks or messing up the creeks, uh, creek bottoms. And if I do have to cross the creek, then and that's always, you always, you know, to access maybe another side of the creek, I always limit to one crossing and we make sure that we follow BMPs. And especially when it comes to stream crossings, we, we look at the BMPs and look at the best stream crossing technique available. And that could be, you know, it could be a timber fork, it could be a laying brush on it and then removing the brush when we're done, or actually bringing in a metal bridge and putting it across the creek to, to, to bring wood back and forth. But that when we're done, we have to stabilize it and prevent sediment from getting into the creek. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Dave. Um, sure. We're going to go ahead and move on with our next speaker. We do have several more questions, um, but we can, uh, one thing I, I failed to mention at the beginning was this meeting will stop at 2.30, but then we'll have a 30-minute after session where folks can stay on and we can answer more of these questions, particularly things that are, are more prevalent on your property if you'd like to ask Dave some more questions. So, um, I do believe he's planning on sticking around for that as well. So hopefully we can get some more of those questions answered. Certainly. All right. Um, so thank you very much, David. All right. Uh, one thing that I was reminded of is all of these webinars, including the webinar that we're, we're seeing today, is recorded and they are available and put on our YouTube channel. So if you will just go to, to YouTube, www.youtube.com, and in their search bar, if you type in Forest Her NC, make sure you type in NC or you will get things that you don't want to, uh, to actually see, uh, Forest Her NC, and it will bring you up to the past webinars that we have hosted. And if you give us about a week, we'll have this webinar up uh, as well in the coming future. So. Just want to make that known. So thanks for reminding me of that. All right. So our next speaker is Amanda Smithson, who is with NC State Parks. So Amanda, if you are ready, I uh, will give you take control. All right. Thank you guys for having me. Um, my name is Amanda Smithson, and I'm the Mountain Region Trail Specialist with North Carolina State Parks. Um, I'll start off with a little disclaimer today that. Um, I do, like many of you, um, have some children at home, so uh, you might hear some dinosaur noises in the background or um, a fussy baby. I do have a two-month-old with me, so um, if she gets a little fussy, I'll do my best to, to keep powering through, but we hope that won't happen. Um, so I, I wear a couple hats with my role with North Carolina State Parks and as the Mountain Region Trail Specialist. Um, foremost, I help um, design and plan trail projects uh, within state parks. Um, second of all, I, I help do some uh, consulting for outside agencies. And third, um, I am the regional contact for the Federal Recreational Trails Program Grant. So if you're a uh, nonprofit or a government agency and um, maybe need some help planning a, a trail project or seeking funding for it, um, let's chat. So sustainable trails, this is really the, the gospel of our program here um, in state parks. And um, historically, trails tended to, you know, kind of run the, the path of least resistance. Um, they were often just kind of utilized on old roadbeds or just the, the easiest way that you could get to the top of the hill to see a cool view. Um, but we we really want to focus more on planning and thinking about an overall design concept that is going to do the least impact on the man. So we are um, seeking to do as little environmental and cultural resource degradation as possible 
and really trying to um, get a trail system that's not really going to tax our overall maintenance demands on that system. Um, now a trail is it's a it's a dynamic entity. No no trail is going to be totally maintenance free, um, but if we design it right, we can really cut down on the amount of inputs um, and, and time and, and headache into that trail system. And when we do that, we end up getting a trail system that hopefully um, maximizes our own enjoyment of it and, and the overall safety of, of those on it. So a few facets that go into this, this sustainability concept. Um, one is, is resource sustainability. We really want to um, avoid or minimize our impacts within sensitive areas, um, you know, whether that be an area with known threatened and endangered species or um, a sensitive area like a wetland. And the second big facet is um, making sure that this trail is physically sustainable. So it's going to look nice, it's going to be um, harmonious with the landscape, and it's also going to um, last a long time. It's going to be a trail that's in here for the long haul and not something that's just going to serve a purpose for, you know, a short duration of time. Uh, and kind of like we saw in our in our previous presentation, um, you know, you got to plan and you got to plan good. Um, folks who want to build trail typically have so much enthusiasm, and that's great. But I tend to be the buzzkill uh, when I walk onto a, a job site because I like to rein in folks back to the planning table and say, you know, this is a great idea, but we've got to do some more planning. And you know, if you fail to plan, then you might as well plan to fail. And um, th there's a couple of steps within that planning phase um, that, are, that are really critical to making sure that you've got a great sustainable trail uh, that you're going to build. First and foremost, uh, we need to think about what's the overall purpose and vision of the trail that, you know, we want to build. And we need to ask ourselves, you know, who is this trail going to be built for? Um, is it primarily just a pedestrian trail network? Do I want to be able to bike on it? Maybe take a horse? Um, do I want to be able to maybe take some, you know, off-highway vehicles on this trail as well? Is it going to be multi-use? You know, do I want to use this to, um, to access, you know, equipment on my property, but, you know, also kind of have a, a, a fun mountain biking trail at the same time? Um, we need to really identify who this trail is going to be for because that really helps shape um, the overall design parameters um, when we're going into planning. And also what's the overall objective of our trail? You know, are we just trying to get from point A to point B? Um, or is the trail itself a destination? You know, are we trying to build a, a network? Um, so having a clear purpose and vision um, is really gonna affect how this trail um, is designed and behaves. And after we kind of get this um, vision of what we want our trail to be, um, we got to source um, some critical baseline data. We got to know what we're working with. Um, first and foremost, you have to know the topography of what you're working with. You cannot plan a trail without knowing um, the contours of your land. Also, boundary data. You don't want to be building trails on, on someone else's land. Surface water what kind of soils you're working with, um, any sensitive resources, remember we want to avoid those, and, uh, and critically some of the existing site features. Um, you can do this by, you know, just using good old paper maps, your old seven and a half minute quadrangle maps, um, but the cool thing about today is there's so many resources that are available at your fingertips. Um, and good spatial data that's, that's free and relatively easy to use now. Um, you know, you can check out your local county GIS. A lot of them have so many layers um, that you can use for planning um, from surface water, topos, um, ortho imagery, um, Google Earth, free also. Um, if you're a public agency, you know, you probably have a trove of internal data already that you can use for planning. Um, so. Um, oh, CalTopo, that's another great one. That's a free resource that has all sorts of great base maps and layers. Um, I highly recommend that for some of your desktop planning. 
And, and when you start gathering these baseline conditions of, of what you're working with and planning your trail, um, you are going to initially kind of start, you know, right at your desktop and eventually move into the field. But you're never just going to plan your trail from your desk and you're never just going to plan your trail uh, from the field. It's going to be a back and forth exercise because you're always going to get surprises um, in the field and you know things aren't going to pop up that, from your data layers. So just be prepared for um, plenty of back and forth between the two. Um, if you are GIS um, or kind of spatial data uh, savvy, or um, you have the ability to um, you know, contract with someone who does, I've been using um, sort of a hill shade approach um, with some transparent ortho imagery. And I've, I've found this is really, really takes down the amount of planning time um, between the field and the desktop because um, I can really get a bird's eye view of kind of, of what I'm working with. Um, this particular alignment, this was, um, we were banging our head against the wall back and forth between the field and, and you know, the office trying to make out good alignments. And it's because this area was just absolutely hammered um, by logging and there was tons of erosion gullies and old road beds. But once we kind of applied this, um, you know, um, hill shading to some good elevation data, we could really see what we were working with on the ground. Um, so highly recommended if you're able to kind of dig that deep. Uh, when I'm out in the field, kind of getting baseline conditions, um, I'm typically either each using a red grade GPS, um, but I also heavily use um, an app called Avenza, and you can download free maps through Avenza, um, um, USGS and US Forest Service maps. And then I can um, also take pictures of interesting features and, and come back to the office and plot this in Google Earth um, or ArcGIS um, if, you, if you have that software available to you. All right, so you've got your vision down pat, you've compiled your initial data. Now we got to identify um, our positive and negative control points um, when we're kind of doing our desktop exercise. So here's sort of a, a base map I made when I started planning this particular trail project. Um, some of the positive control points that I might use in my trail planning would obviously be the, the, um, the sort of beginning and, and destination points. In this particular um, um, site, we were trying to get from um, a front country camping area and parking lot and paddle access. Um, over to some backcountry campsites. This is at New River State Park. Um, so some positive control points might be, you know, sort of the existing trailheads, um, existing trails that you might have. Um, interesting features you might want to hit along the way, like a, a potential flat area for a campsite. Um, it could be, um, you know, a place that you could easily cross a stream. Um, those would be some positive control points that we would ideally want to route the trail to. Um, and then negative control points um, that you need to identify would be um, steep slopes, drainages, um, surface water as well, because, you know, you don't want to be causing, um, you know, a lot of stress to sensitive environments. Um, you also probably would not want to route your trout, your uh, trail through a, a floodplain, um, you know, um, that could make for a muddy trail or, you know, structures that could easily get washed away. Um, or utility lines, like this was um, um, a power line right through here. Um, so after you've kind of figured out your, your places you, you do want to go and your places that you don't want to go, how do you, how do you kind of meander through that and connect the dots? And if we go back to sort of our, our two facets that we need to remember about sustainable trails, you know, we need to avoid those sensitive spots, um, but we also need to make it harmonious across the landscape. And we do that by designing a trail that's going to resist erosion, primarily resisting erosion from water and users. And we employ a, a design technique called uh, rolling contour trails. And this is a, a type of trail that is continually 
encouraging water uh, to sheet across the, the trail tread. Um, it's ultimately trying to reduce water velocity if water gets onto the trail tread and just get it off the trail as quickly as possible. And when we design our trails in this kind of rolling contour fashion, um, we're hopefully greatly reducing the need that we'll need to put structures on our trail. Um, structures, you know, can be costly. They require more maintenance and can be prone to failure and sometimes even greater resource damage. And this is what a rolling contour trail looks like on landscape. You'll see that it is generally built parallel to the existing contours on the land. Um, it might utilize natural features to drain water um, and they undulate slightly. And this is kind of what they look like in the wild. Um, I'm standing here on, on one side of a drainage uh, and you'll see that the trail is going in an uphill fashion. Um, but while going uphill, you know, we've used some of the natural features like um, uh, trees to kind of wrap around and, and make the trail move up and down along the way. Let me get my pointer. There, you see how um, we've wrapped this trail kind of around the base of these trees as we're continually going up. And this is what it looks like when we connect the dots. You know, we avoided the floodplains. We tried our best here to avoid some of these steep slopes, these really narrow drainages down here. We capitalized on the existing trail system, some good flat spots over here for potential campsites. Um, and we, we, we crossed the, the stream here at the easiest um, low grade possible. And, um, and we stayed as parallel to the contours as possible instead of working against them. This is what sustainable trails do not look like. We never want to try to design them so they are running perpendicular to the natural contours of the land. Um, because when we run our trails um, in, in a steep fashion like this, it's really hard to get water off and it really becomes a compounding problem. problem. Um, the water ends up gaining velocity um, and it ends up taking more soil and rocks with it. And over time, it just becomes almost impossible to get that water off of your trail tread. And that's what it looks like when you run a trail or a road um, kind of against your natural contours. It's almost impossible to fix when it gets to this level. Um, so we don't want that. Now we can't always just run along the exact same contour when we're going from point A to B. Um, that would be boring. So we've got to employ a couple of little techniques along the way in the field when we're designing. Um, four main tenets of, of designing sustainable trail and in, in this rolling contour fashion um, is remembering the half rule, the 10% rule, um, outsloping your tread and grade reversals. And to understand and employ these, um, we have to have an objective way to measure steepness in our trail, in our trail plan. And in, in trails, we use uh, percent grade, and that's just the rise of a run uh, times 100, and that's how you get percent grade or percent steepness of your trail. Uh, number one, the half rule. So this is an especially important rule if you are um, designing a trail in um, the Piedmont, uh, coastal plains, or an area that just does not have a whole lot of um, topography. Because it's so easy to break if you're not um, continually measuring out your trail along the way. Um, and the way the half rule works is if you have a prevailing side slope, um, you never want to design your trail so that your trail is more than one half of what that prevailing side slope is. So in this example, if you have a 20% grade side slope, you never want your trail grade to be more than 10%. Because if you do, water is going to take that path of least resistance right down your trail tread. And remember, 
we want to get it off as quickly as possible. So we want to encourage sheet flow across your trail. Um, and it'll kind of look like this if you design it under that half threshold, it'll go right across. Yeah. Um, the second big rule is remembering the 10% rule. Um, the 10% rule is, I'll be honest, not a hard and fast rule, but it's something that you really should employ in the field um, when you're laying out your trail. 10% um, is a, it's a good metric because it works best with most soil types and it's a comfortable grade. You know, if you're, if you're making an average trail grade that is, you know, pushing 15, 20%, you're going to get a lot of erosion on your trail and it's probably not going to be um, a super enjoyable experience because you're just going to be sweating and sucking air the whole time. So we try to keep our trail grade averages um, under 10%. Um, occasionally you'll have a short run where you, you, you know, you've just got to get over this rock or this tree. So it's acceptable in short runs to have, um, you know, a little bit greater than a 10%, um, grade, but overall we try to keep it under that 10% threshold. Um, outslope. This is probably one of my, my favorite things to remember when you're, um, laying out your sustainable trail and it's because it encourages the sheet flow so well. Um, with most of our single track trails and state parks, we kind of do um, somewhere in the three to 5% neighborhood uh, for outsloping our, our tread. But the wider your trail is, the more outslope you're going to need to have to encourage water to sheet off. Um, so if you've got maybe like a, a four to five foot trail, I would even encourage maybe five to 7%. You just never want an outslope so great that you feel like your ankles are rolling. And so remember, we're trying to get water to sheet off the side of the trail, never go down the trail. And grade reversals. I like to think of grade reversals as kind of an insurance policy on your trail tread and just in case water gets trapped on it. Um, you know, even if we've kept our grades low, uh, we still kind of, you know, had to have that little backup. Um, grade reversals are designed into your trail tread. Um, and they um, hopefully will significantly increase the longevity of your trail and, and cut back on your maintenance needs. Um, we typically employ a little grade reversal about every 20 to 50 feet in our trails. Um, you're gonna want to space them closer together um, the more steep your trail tread is. But what it is is really just an undulation um, in your trail. So um, you've, you've given water a nice outlet to get off just in case it gets trapped on your, on your trail tread. And this is what it looks like in the wild. This is the prevailing side slope of your trail right here. And even though this trail is heading downhill, um, we have reversed the grade of our trail. So we have actually gone uphill instead of down um, using a natural feature like these rocks in this tree. Um, so this has encouraged water to get off the trail right here um, before it starts to rise. And you can see a little bit of deposition right here. And then um, as soon as we come down off of this rise, it's got another little opportunity to get off right here where Tyson's standing. It kind of comes up again. And we've got another one down here. So we're never giving water a chance to gain velocity. Um, so it can take a lot of our trail soil with it. You might be like, okay, well, this sounds great, um, but you know, I've already got a trail network, or I've already got a road network. Um, you know, should I, I think about building a new trail system, or or kind of use what I've already got? And that's a really difficult uh, question, and it doesn't really have a clear cut answer. Um, it really just depends on how much time, money, and effort you know you want to put in to um, your trail network and, and what your ultimate goals are. Um, but there are uh, um, a couple of, of things that you can use to sort of retrofit your existing um, trail network or, or even sort of trail road network um, to make it more sustainable. Um, one of the, the first retrofit structures that you can put in your, your trail is uh, called a NIC. And this is just a very small kind of um, um, semicircle that is shaved into your trail tread. Um, typically you'll install a NIC 
kind of between uh, two high points. So if you've got an area in your existing trail that tends to puddle water, um, a nick is what you need. And you kind of shave it um, in towards the middle, of no more than like a 15% um, change from, from the um, uphill sections of your, of your nick. But you want it to be nice and wide and broad. It should be pretty imperceptible to someone walking on your tread. This is kind of what it looks like. I'm standing on a high spot, the trail is moving uphill, and it's just kind of shaved out here as a, as a nice little drain. Um, probably the, the, the best known retrofit structure for your trail is a rolling gray dip. And a rolling gray dip is an installed feature that kind of takes the place of um, a grade reversal in, in a new trail. Um, a, a rolling gray dip is a modern approach to um, trails that you may have seen water bars on back in the day. Um, water bars are kind of a dirty word with sustainable trail building. Um, we don't use them. They cause a lot of problems. Um, I won't get too far down that rabbit hole, but uh, we can talk about it if, if that question comes up in the Q&A. But basically a rolling gray dip is a nick that has a berm on the downhill side. Um, so you've got that, you know, that really gentle um, area kind of carved into your trail to let it drain. And then there's a ramp on the downhill side so water doesn't have a chance to keep going. Um, and you want your ramp to be nice, long and broad. Um, you, don't, you don't want it to be um, kind of really jarring in your trail. And you'll angle it um, generally at about a 45 degree angle to um, the pitch of your trail tread. So the steeper your trail tread is, you know, the, um, the more intense your angle is going to be for that, for that berm. And just like with a rolling gray dip, um, you're going to want to install these probably about every 20 to 50 feet the steeper your trail, um, the more you're going to want to employ. And this is what kind of what they look like. It's a, a really soft dip with a nice long berm on the other side. This is what you do not want your rolling grade dip to look like. Um, this was a good attempt, but it the nick portion was installed much, much too narrow. And this is problematic and causes more maintenance on your trail because um, when water hits these at such a, a hard angle, it tends to deposit a lot of the rock and, and leaves as you can see right here. And this is basically no more than a, an earthen water bar. So make sure when you're, when you're making your retrofit structures that you, you really carve out a nice, good, broad, easy way for water to kind of creep off your trail. Um, when we're laying out our, our, our trail in the field, um, you cannot be without a clinometer. It's, it's critical. We don't, generally um, eyeball our, our grades. Um, we, we actually use tools out in the field, so we make sure that we're getting accurate numbers. Um, we use clinometers and um, we use percent grade, as we talked about earlier, uh, when you're looking through your kilometer. Uh, make sure before you go out in the field that um, if, you're, if you're using a friend um, to kind of lay out your alignment with, that you, um, you find um, kind of your, your baseline zero um, on flat level ground, because you don't want to be taking wrong measurements. Um, when we're laying out the trail, uh, we typically walk it with our land managers, um, if that's someone you know besides you, because they always have invaluable information um, that you're not going to find, you know, on, you know, Forest Service maps or or whatnot. And they're going to be able to tell you like the areas that tend to flood or pool water or Maybe there's an old, old home site that didn't pop up, you know, sort of in your initial recon. So make sure you're walking it with people who know the land well. Um, next, we'll flag the corridor. That's kind of a course alignment. Um, and then we pin flag the corridor. And that's where we um, kind of get into the, the art of, of trail design and the absolute final alignment that will ultimately be what we build. When we flag it, we just use um, sort of regular survey tape. Um, I typically do it at, right at eye level. So if I need to go back out by myself, um, I can easily shoot grade right there at my own flag points. Um, I use half hitches um, on my trees because I will, if 
find something that um, causes me to reassess my alignment and never fails. Um, so you want something that you can easily um, take down and, and replace on a different tree. Um, thicker the vegetation, you know, you're going to want to make sure you have um, laid down a whole lot of flagging so it's easily visible. Um, and also crucially is placement of the knot. Um, you want to place the knot somewhere um, in relation to where you actually want the trail to be constructed. So like in this instance, this means that the trail is going to go uphill of these particular trees right here. And then, um, you know, after we're satisfied with sort of our course alignment, we'll come back in um, with pin flags and actually delineate exactly where we want the trail to be cut in. Um, some people do a center line uh, to kind of give your contractor or whomever more uh, leeway with constructing the trail. Um, I tend to pin flag on the uphill section of, of where I want the trail to go. So this is exactly where I want the trail to be cut or um, um, like the very first strike of the Pulaski or this is where I want the blade to go of the excavator or, or desert when it comes through to build this trail. And you also notice in this picture that um, the, the vegetation that we cleared um, has been cut at you know, about navel height. Um, and this makes it much easier to um, pull trees out. Um, uh, or you know, if you're doing it by hand or with an excavator, it just gives you much more leverage to get these trees out of your, of your corridor. And I can promise you, <laughs> even after you've you designed your trail well, um, things are gonna pop up um, and you just gotta be able to roll with the punches. Um, you also kind of need to think about, you know, how do you want to build your trail? Um, do you want to build it with mechanized construction or do you want to do it all by hand? Um, you know, mechanized construction, there's some real benefits to it. It gives you a nice uniform uh, trail and trail surface. It's pretty efficient. Um, but, you know, there's also a lot of enjoyment out of being able to hand build a trail yourself and say, I, you know, I built this with my own two hands. Um, or, you know, it's also kind of expensive to rent or purchase equipment. So, you know, hand building might be the only option. Um, but either way, um, both are, have their, their pros and cons for the, um, the desired outcome. Um, something you think about too with logistics of mechanized equipment is, are you even able to get a piece of machinery out there to this site? Um, so for some people, that's kind of a make or break, whether they even do mechanized equipment um, to build their, build their trails. And that previous picture we saw, that was, I'll go back one slide. This is a, um, a trail that was rough cut with a, a small trail dozer. And this is what it looks like when it's almost finished. Um, We've pushed the majority of the dirt out of the way with the dozer. We came back in with an excavator and laid this back slope nicely. And you can see that um, the spoils that were removed on this trail have been broadcast uniformly on the, on the downhill side. A couple of tools that you'll need. Um, this, these are indispensable for both maintenance and building your trail. Um, a Pulaski, um, that's great for um, moving dirt and chopping roots. Um, my favorite trail tool uh, is probably the McLeod. I'm laughing a little bit because um, some hard feelings about trail tools in the trail world, but um, I like McLeod's. You can chop up small roots with it. Um, you can move dirt, but more importantly, it's a great tool for um, compacting your trail tread. Um, also really like fire broom rakes. Um, this is a, a tool that gives you a really nice, smooth, even appearance on your trail. Um, and you can get a lot of these tools from, from forestry suppliers. In fact, you'll notice that a lot of the tools that we use are pretty much um, the same tools that you'll find in wildland firefighting. Um, so, Well, if you're not convinced that you, know, you wanna spend all your time hand building a trail, um, you've got a couple options with, with mechanized tools. 
Um, the vast majority of our trails and state parks are built with mini excavators. Um, there, it's a great choice. You can, you know, dig your bench out easily. You can uh, shape your back slope with it, but it's also really good for, uh, you know, removing trees and, and rocks within your path. Um, if you really want to get efficient with your trail building, um, you can uh, either rent or purchase a um, a very small uh, trail specialized dozers. Um, these are super efficient. They're great at moving dirt. Um, it might be a little hard to come by, but if you have that option, um, I highly recommend it for efficiency. Um, but also mini skid steers are a good choice as well. Um, you can, you know, push dirt with them. You can get plate compactor uh, attachments for it for compacting your trail later on. Um, augers, if you think you'll need some fencing along the path or whatnot. Um, the only caveat is um, it might be a little difficult if you have a um, particularly rooty um, landscape that you're, that you're trying to build your trail on. Amanda, you've got Go about it. five minutes. Thanks. Um, so when we're constructing our, our, our rolling contour trail, um, we are seeking to build a trail in full bench fashion. And that means we are uh, kind of at a building at a right angle, right within our existing side hill. Um, we are coming through building, just like it sounds, a bench. And then we're eventually gonna come back and lay back that back slope um, and outslope our trail tread, just like we talked about earlier with our sustainable principles and, and, and compact that trail tread so that soil isn't going anywhere. And this is kind of what it looks like. You kind of got that right angle bench, broadcasting all your spoils, laying your back slope back to approximately a 45 degree angle. You just don't want leaves or vegetation to easily bear to fall off of it. Um, that's a, a good rule of thumb. If the leaves don't stick on it, then it, your, your back cut's probably a little too steep. And then out slope. Remember, we want to get water to sheet off of that trail tread. And then we compact it. We don't want our dirt going anywhere. So to kind of tie it all up, um, sustainable trails, they're better for the environment. Uh, it's a better experience for you, the user. And uh, over time, it's hopefully a better investment. Um, to do that, you need to spend a good amount of time planning for your trail um, and, and working with any key stakeholders that might be a part of that process. Uh, remember, water is your greatest enemy. Uh, make sure you're following those critical um, guidelines when you're out in the field laying your trail out to minimize um, any impacts. Make sure you're building trails in a full bench fashion. And foremost, be safe because we wanna build trails that look like this, harmonious with the landscape um, and not trails that look like this and, and cause us a lot of maintenance issues, safety issues, um, and a lot of heartache over the long run. If you wanna dive deeper into sustainable trails, um, I highly recommend um, Trail Solutions, uh, Imbo's Guide to Building Sweet Single Track. This is sort of, um, the, the Bible for modern sustainable trail building. Also, um, Minnesota uh, Department of Natural Resources um, Trail Planning Design and Development Guidelines. This is a, a free publication that you can get um, right off of Minnesota DNR's website. Um, this is a lot of great info for planning and especially maintaining your trail networks. And if all the techniques of uh, sustainable trail design just don't work out and you need a little something extra. I also highly recommend um, the U.S. Forest Service, um, their standard trail specs webpage. Um, they have tons of great diagrams and resources um, for, for structures that you might need on your trail um, and even diagrams for, um, you know, some of the, the structures that we talked about earlier. If you need to pass them along to a, a contractor, you might be building your trail. Um, but that's all I have for now. Um, if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, we have a really easy website for our program. It's just trails.mbos.org. 
nc.gov. Um, and my email is amanda.smithson at ncparks.gov. Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one is from Lynn. Uh, we have a parallel on grade trail down to the creek and they have placed debris on the down slope for several years. Um, they still have too steep of a grade on the trail. So what methods for building up the down slope area versus digging out the upside and trying to level it? Did you catch um, all that? Yeah, that's a little site specific. I would say um, it makes maintaining your trail so much easier if you're able to um, broadcast a lot of your soils and vegetation from your downhill slope as far away from your trail as possible. Um, that's, that's gonna make um, shaping and maintaining your trail so much easier in the long run. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. Um, it, it really is site specific if you need to move your trail up or down, um, if it's too steep. If, if you've got a short run that's just just too steep, um, you know, it, it definitely would be worth the time and effort, I think, to look at rerouting your trail. Um, and if you've got, you know, a really short window that you can reroute that trail in, um, you know, you can also do some, some other structural techniques like, um, like switchbacks um, to sort of break the grade getting down to your destination. Okay, thank you. Um, are there, uh, who is out there that can help landowners plan for this? Is there a, a, a counterpart of yours in the Piedmont or in the Coastal Plain? I do. An extension great. specialist? Yeah, great question. Um, so I'm the mountain region. Um, we also have Ben Rippey. He is in the Piedmont. Um, he does the same thing I do. And Bob Tabor is located in the Coastal Plain. Um, we are, um, most of the time we assist um, you know, public agencies and nonprofits, but on a limited basis and if we have time, um, we can um, provide resources and, and some consultation for, um, for other folks as well. Um, and there are private trail designers. Um, a lot of um, trail contractors also do um, trail design on the side. Um, they can also kind of um, do design builds where they wrap up design cost and with their um, per foot construction costs as well. Okay, great. And uh, last question would be, uh, could you throw the slide back up ahead your websites or do you have? Let's see if I can get out of my presentation, I'll show you. Okay. <laughs> and it looks like Deanna Noble has been placing some of the, uh, the websites for one of the book, the trails, nc.gov program link is in the chat box. She got it, I is, think. Yeah, okay. As well as the contacts for the Piedmont and the Coastal Plain region. Yep, here we go. Trails.nc.gov and we even have a, a handy little interactive map um, where you can hover over your county and, and find who your contact is. And um, if you're a public agency, um, this will also correspond to whom you contact for the Recreational Trails Program grant. Okay, I think folks are still seeing your presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> here, I'll try to, here we go. Yeah, here's, here's that interactive map I was talking about. It uh, trails.nc.gov and you can hover over your county and it'll, it'll tell you who your rep is. Perfect, that's awesome. All right, well, great. Well, thank you so much uh, for that, Amanda. Definitely a lot to consider um, with planning being their first step. So that's it's a great tool that we can uh, to think about, tools out there that can reach out to folks that can help them and things to think about as they walk their property and consider some trails. Um, so thank you so much, Amanda. So uh, we're getting close to our time. So uh, just we'll do something real quick here just to keep moving forward. We're almost done. So thank you very much again, uh, Dave Holly and Amanda Smithson for joining us today. Uh, that was great information you helped pass along. And um, 
So before we leave uh, the uh, official meeting and go into an after session, there'll be time for more questions for our speakers. Uh, we do have two travel mugs to give away. Of course, each one of our four star webinars, we, we try to give a, a free gift since we can't really meet in person. And uh, we do have two. So Laura Geisler and John Froelich, uh, you got you two are lucky winners of a four star travel mug. So we'll send this to you in the mail or we'll contact you and see the best way to get this to you. So congratulations on that. Coming up, we have several workshops still in the works. Of course, these are workshops geared mostly towards landowners and trying to get you out and about and thinking about your woods and learning more about how to manage your property. Uh, March 11th will be the third meeting in our series of Enjoying Your Woods. So this will talk about some citizen science projects to kind of get you and maybe your family involved and, and actually getting out there and looking at the woods and, and enjoying your woods safely, uh, particularly uh, with maybe ticks and snakes that, you know, things that folks always are concerned about. We, uh, we have some information to share to, to get outside and enjoy it safely. Uh, coming up in April, we'll start our next series about protecting your woods. And so look for us in April. So we do hope that you'll make plans to join our upcoming webinars as well. And if you're looking to reach out to Forrest Her, if you're looking for more information, please uh, join our Facebook group. Uh, check us out. It's uh, trying to create a community where folks can ask questions, feel comfortable sharing pictures. If you're into social media, then here's an opportunity for you to get on there uh, looking to provide real um, real positive uh, sharing of material and helping to connect people that uh, to those professionals that can help you in your local area. Also check us out on Instagram, but if you are not a social media person, that's great, no problem. Uh, if you're on our email listserv, you'll continue to get information about upcoming events. And uh, we look forward to those days that we can actually do in-person workshops and actually be able to connect and share a little more and, and shake hands with people. So that will be a, a great day when that comes up. And uh, our web, website is still in the mix. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today, taking this hour and a half out of your time. We appreciate it very much. Once again, if you still have more questions, I know there was a lot of questions we couldn't get to and apologize for that. But if you wanna stay on, we will try to get those questions answered. Um, as you leave here today, you, this should take you to an evaluation form. And we would appreciate your help, just five minutes, just to, to give us some input, give us your thoughts on how these webinar series are going, uh, maybe some ideas about what you're looking for or have questions about that you'd like to see more of in the future. So thank you again for joining us today. All right, so David and Amanda, so if you just hang tight with us for a minute, then we'll... Looks like we've most we've lost most of our participants, so we've got about 80 folks still on. Uh, wasn't sure if you guys are able to see how many we had before, but we did have about 147 on today's webinar, so that was great. Uh, a lot of folks out there listening. All right, so if you two are ready, we'll go through and maybe answer or ask you some of these other questions that are on here. Some of them are, are kind of site specific. You know, they're looking for thinking about their own land. So we'll try to see what we can do there. Um, so Dave, the first one I think would be for you. The, uh, Patricia is getting the Loblolly Pine Plantation thinned in, I guess, come, uh, I guess she was hoping to get it thinned this winter. Um, and she does, is working with a consultant. But what do you think the effects to wildlife could be if she is not getting this harvesting done this winter? Well, my first reaction is that it's this has been a really wet winter. I wouldn't want to be thinning anything this time of year. It just uh, saturated conditions. You know, we just had what, 13 named hurricanes come through last year. So be patient with your consultant. I think the best time to thin a stand is when it's dry. So just don't, don't worry. I think uh, I wouldn't have thinned it during the winter. I think you're, you know, unless you're on real dry sandy ground, I think you're better off waiting and doing it in the summer or spring anyway. Um, there are some impacts with wildlife, maybe spring, you know, spring bird nesting, but ultimately the thinning is going to improve your habitat. So you may be a step back, but you're going to be like five steps forward. So yeah, be patient. 
I've had a lot of contracts last year that just I had to extend because it was just too wet. Jennifer, you're muted. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Patricia, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, she still is on, so that's great. Um, I think she had one more question, too. Um, will loggers watch out for coyote or fox dens? Is that, I guess that's a question for me. Um, That'd be a question more for you. Yes. What's your thoughts on that? Well, my thought is that prior loggers don't know, you know where those dens are. So most likely, no, they're not on the lookout for them. But I would say if you have them and you know where they are, it's, it's critical in that planning process that those areas are protected if, you have, if you're interested in protecting them. But no, the loggers, you know, they're, they're there to do their job and get out of there. They're very, you know, they're not gonna be looking for, for holes like that or dens. So I, I put that responsibility back on the landowner and the consultant. Great. Okay. Uh, it looks like the next question is also for you, Dave. Um, how do you suggest cleaning out stream beds of down trees? My advice is don't do it. I mean, <laughs> I think debris in the stream is fine. All that detritus that's breaking up and providing food for, for also things in the stream. I think people always want to see a nice, clean, open stream, but I think down and falling debris is fine as long as it's natural. I mean, it, unless you're asking about a stream crossing where a logger crossed it and you plugged it up, that's a different situation. But um, I would not, I would, my advice is to leave it alone. Yes, and, and from the forest service, I know we've talked a little bit about riparian buffers and, and uh, some of the forestry best management practices. And there's also forest practice guidelines. And so you do want to be careful when you start messing around your stream. I know there's been several questions about Cleaning up dry creeks was one of them uh, and cleaning up some of our other streams. You do want to be careful with that. Um, if there's, if it's logging debris, obviously that should come out. But some of the natural materials, if it's a large creek or large river, I think there's actually some permits that actually have to occur for, for some of that to, some of that larger debris to be removed. So you don't want to be getting into the middle of that. But if you're talking about a small little ephemeral drain that only runs water directly after it rains within the next day or two after heavy rainfalls. Uh, a lot of those small limbs and leaves actually help to slow down the water, which is actually a positive thing um, if you're on a, on a slope. Now, as you get closer to the coastal plain where there's not a lot of slope, uh, then no, that would be a, an opportunity to, to maybe pull some of that out. You don't wanna block up that creek or block up water. Let's see, what else can we find here? All right, so here's one, another one for you, Dave. All right, when your forest is surrounded by expanding suburban development in Wake County, are there variables in sustaining a long range hardwood forest? It's a lot of challenges there. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's, uh... Yeah, if you live in Wake County, it's tough. You know, if you've got all these people that are building around you, especially if you want to use fire. You know, I like using fire in hardwood stands. Um, it makes it more challenging. But no, I, I wouldn't give up. I'd just say, you know, if you're an ag district, I would recommend that you get involved in a voluntary ag district. That kind of takes a little bit of the burden off. So if anybody builds near you, they, they understand that, hey, you're, we're, you're building near a working forest and that there's going to be certain things that happen like harvesting and smoke that you know you're going to have to to get you know be okay with because you're moving into that area um but yes it's become more and more challenging to practice forestry in 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 a, in a urban community urban building community even loggers are more more reluctant to do any kind of logging in those areas too because of the the, the safety factors and the, and the disturbance of neighbors so but i just say you know be Courteous of your neighbors, but you know I think you can still continue to practice on, on a sustainable basis. I agreed. Uh, we we need to uh, still manage where we can. Uh, it's just as important to have healthy forest stands around our our more urban areas as much as it is in the woods. It's just uh, or in more rural areas. Excuse me. 
um, it just is uh, more long range planning, I guess, and uh, not as actively managed, um, maybe some different objectives in those areas that are more highly developed. Um, so Amanda, we do have another one for you. Um, how close should you build a trail to a small to a small creek? And are there best management practices? Yeah, and I think some of those actually might overlap a little bit with um, you know forestry practices too. Um, if we are building a trail uh, proximal to water, or, or if it needs to come close to or, or get across a stream, we generally try to get it out of the floodplain uh, as as quickly as possible. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, you, you don't want a, a trail or any structures there that are going to be particularly at risk um, to a, a flooding situation. Um, and, you know, no one wants a, a, a yucky, wet, boggy trail. So we, we typically try to get it in and out as quick as possible. Um, if you do need to do a, a stream crossing, you know, try to do it as, as um, a 90 degree angle as best as possible. Um, that's gonna hopefully minimize the, the span of any crossing that you need. And also, you know, there's some considerations to think about as far as permitting, um, you know, if you're, if you're getting hyper close to a stream, um, there might be trout buffer rules um, that you might need to adhere to. Um, and you generally don't wanna be taking out a whole lot of vegetation, um, you know, close to, your, close to your stream. So my advice would be, um, you know, if you want to get close to stream to, to have a, a nice view shed or, or a point to get water across, um, try to minimize the time that you're in the floodplain and in your crossings. Okay, great. Um, Amanda, it looks like we do have another one. Uh, talking about water bars, um, I think, I believe you said that water bars would not necessarily be your first choice, um, no. but it looks like this person uh, was part of a trail building crew uh, in the early 90s and was just wondering if there is a, a difference in terminology or maybe why you wouldn't use those anymore? Sure. Uh, water bars were heavily used, um, you know, before kind of the, the this modern concept of sustainable trail design. And they function a lot like um, the rolling grade that does, um, except they're, they're much more abrupt. They um, they, they shoot water off the trail hard and fast, whereas a rolling grade dip is a, a much smoother, um, sort of natural, easy approach to kind of encourage water to get off your trail gently. Um, water bars kind of function a lot like, like a jetty or a groin do, um, you know, on the coast. They build up a whole lot of material on one side and they starve the downhill side of your trail of that natural flow of sediment. And so you, over time, you, you get a really large step between your, your water bar and your, your natural trail surface. The hikers and bikers and anyone else using the trail hates it. And so over time, they end up walking around these water bars, um, which causes greater vegetation impacts, um, trail widening, your trail ends up braiding, um, and, and you have to continually maintain them, the function. Um, they easily get clogged up with leaves and rocks and dirt. Um, so they just um, kind of contribute to more maintenance on the trail, which is what we're trying to get away from um, with the concept of sustainable trail design and really just aren't enjoyable um, for, for trail users. Okay, great, great. It looks like we have another one for you, uh, one that was asked earlier in the presentation. Um, looks like they just purchased a 20 acre piece of property and they're concerned about building a trail along their property line that it may attract hunters or neighbors or upset their neighbors. Do you have any ideas to, to keep unwanted folks out of the area? Sure, um, you know, and that's kind of a, a question that, you know, I've been ruminating with planting some trails on my own property. Um, generally, property and boundary lines are a negative control point when we're planting our trails. Um, for that very reason, you know, we don't want to encourage unauthorized use. Um, and, you know, your neighbors might think it just doesn't look good. Um, they might have a not share sort of our, our goals and values for trail aesthetics. Um, so that being said, I would avoid 
um, you know, trying to run your trail as close to the property line as possible. Um, you know, that should hopefully um, dissuade people from creating unauthorized trails or, or getting onto your trail system that you might not want to. Um, we also in state parks and on private lands employ um, trail cameras. Um, so you can pop a regular game camera up um, to kind of see who's on your trails and um, also, you know, make sure you're throwing up your purple paint, your um, private property signs and make sure it's well marked. Great. I had another one for you and I just lost it. Um, okay. Uh, well, I had another one for you, Amanda, and I'll have to go back and find it. So uh, Dave, we'll give you a chance to talk again. Um, how about using draft horses to harvest in North Carolina? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, or are there people available? There, there, I think there's certainly there's people out there. That just, it's just not very, you know, there's not a, a big force of those. I've used actually draft horses on, with a client. Um, one, one of the problems I have with draft horses in this particular case was they were able to log it, but they weren't able to merchandise it. So they could drag it to the site that they had. Somebody actually had to come in and, and process the wood for them. So um, I, I would encourage it. You know, I just, it, for those landowners out there, especially in the Piedmont, it's just, it's not, uh, they're not those out there. I, I've, I've gotten some phone calls with individuals interested in starting business in this area. I would certainly encourage it, but for the most landowners, the conventional logger is probably their main source of harvesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, Amanda, <laughs> found the question that we were looking for, <laughs> and it, it may have been actually for Dave, um, but I think it would be for Amanda as well. Uh, on the trail, should stumps be removed? Yes. Yes, um, we typically try to totally dig them out um, um, with the dozer excavator. Um, but if for some reason, you know, you just gotta have your alignment right there, uh, you can't tweak it around the stump. Um, I would recommend cutting it as flush to the ground as possible. Um, you know, if you leave a, a stump that's just kind of, you know, cut right off um, and not chewed up with a chainsaw or, you know, you've not hacked at it with a Pulaski. It just looks a little unnatural in your, in your trail corridor. Um, and, and depending on kind of your, your grade, folks might tend to braid around it. So if you cut it as flush to the ground as possible, if you can't get it out, um, that's, that's generally the, um, the best work around to it. Okay. Well, Dave, let's just talk about uh, stump removal in uh, more typical forest management as well. Um, are folks typically removing stumps after they're harvesting timber? No, and I don't recommend it. I mean, when you do cutting, you know, there's usually a stump there. A lot of some clients have asked me, why are they going to get rid of those stumps? And I just say, you know, no, they're going to rot. They're going to, some of them will actually respout if they're hardwood. So, no, that's just, it's, it, you would disturb the soil conditions. I just say the best thing is to uh, is to let them you know let them rot on the on the stump. Um, sometimes I get that question around stump wads. You know when you do a land clearing operation or like a road, what do you you know we throw the stumps off? We shake the dirt out of them and then we throw the stumps off to the side. And some people are concerned the way that looks. And I don't know. To me, that's good wildlife habitat. It's good for salamanders and lizards. Um, I've even done big piles of them and it's excellent habitat for critters like that. So, um, and they slowly rot over time. So I just, uh, that that's my advice on stumps, uh, tree cut stumps is let them rot. Ones that you dig up and shake out, you know, as long as you distribute them and place them around, I think they're actually a habitat improvement instead of a, yes, they have maybe a negative initial impact, but over time they, they, they rot and fall apart. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we'll have a go back here. Um, when we were talking about using draft horses. Um, it looks like Amy Tomcha, who was with Audubon, North Carolina, and works out of Burnsville up there in the mountains. Uh, she ha does have a horse logger contact. So if someone in the mountain region was interested in learning more about using draft horses, 
uh, to harvest some timber, uh, you could contact Amy. Her information is in the chat box. It's just amy.tomcho at Audubon, North Carolina. Okay, uh, so how about this? Uh, so this is a, a different question. Um, so do you know of anyone using bison to keep some of the areas of their forest land open? So I'm assuming more of an open, you've got the forest canopy and they're walking through the forest stand. I do not. I mean, I have, I have a client that has silver pasture and he grazes cattle on it, but no, I don't have any experience with buffalo. Yeah, we, we, there's, a, there's several buffalo or bison farmers up in uh, the Piedmont in North Carolina. Uh, I am familiar personally just with the one up in Person County, but of course those are more, those are such heavy animals that would cause a lot of damage to your trees. And so that would be more of open ag land, uh, lots of, of farmland that they would need to graze. Uh, typically don't see them grazing underneath a forest stand um, just because they, they are such, create such, a bat, such an impact. And I think when it comes to livestock, you really, you can't just let them do, you know, graze in woodland indefinitely. It has to be rotational. It has to be well-timed. Uh, I've seen where overgrazing has actually damaged the soil and damaged, you know, the health of the trees. Uh, especially for, pop, you know, pigs and hogs, if you don't rotate them on a, a regular basis to different paddocks, um, you can really cause some bad forest damage. So it's, it's a rotational grazing kind of issue. And if you do it, you can do it well. I, I've even seen hog farmers, you know, they, they allow them to go in after the acorns have dropped just to help cure the meat, give it sort of an oaky flavor. So, but they only keep them there a couple of weeks and then they got to pull them out. Yeah, buffalo is a big creature. I, I'm, I just can't imagine them kind of walking through the woods and, and not, you know, even with their, their hooves causing a lot of soil compaction and damage to trees. Great, yeah, key would be short stints for sure. Okay, well, um, I think we've answered most of the questions. Um, I guess there was a question here I missed about sweet gums. Um, everybody's favorite tree, sweet gums. Uh, someone has some sweet gums they need to remove. Any suggestions on what to do with them? Um, it's pretty much all, I'm not sure who that's coming from, so I can't really reach out to see if they wanna have any more information. Well, my biggest question is how big are they? You know, is it yeah. something? The other thing is, we always, a lot of times we would try to get a lot of sweet gum, but there is a market for sweet gum logs now that didn't exist before. So don't, you know, don't poo poo sweet gum. You know, it goes straight and it's it's good wood product, um, makes good chips. So, um, but yeah, I think if you're trying to get rid of sweet gum, maybe around your house, then, you know, cutting it down, treating the stump with a herbicide to keep it from re sprouting. Or, uh, you know, I would have to know more about the situation to know what they're talking about getting rid of sweet gum. Yeah, and it looks like they may have been talking about reseeding after a thinning. That must have been what that was. So after a thinning and open up the forest, uh, what can you do to slow down the growth of the sweet gum that's starting to, to regrow? Well, there's a couple it's things. Fun. After a thinning, I think Use of fire, you know, two or three years after, you know, it will actually knock the sweet gum down, at least to back down to the ground. We get, we top kills the, the sweet gum, but it, it doesn't kill the roots. So a lot of times it will re-sprout. The other thing is consider is a mid-rotation herbicide release where you actually, you know, once it's thin, those, you have those nice lanes that they use to pull the wood out. You can bring a skitter in there and you can apply a herbicide, um, a selective herbicide, and it, you can control that that uh, sweet gum on your store using that, using a product that's labeled for sweet gum. Okay. All right, so uh, one more question that actually is coming up several times, talking about gullies uh, or large creeks, really more uh, large erosion that is occurring through the forest. Uh, several folks have had some questions about that. Um, who should they talk to? It would be a person that they could contact about looking at a large goalie or eroded area in the woods? I, I usually recommend a couple of uh, contractors that I use that are specialists in kind of road design and, and correcting problematic erosion problems. Um, you know, it usually requires a backhoe or a bulldozer. Um, I usually take a look at it, I can evaluate it 
and then I can easily refer them to a contractor to, to correct the problem. Um, it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it depends on the severity of the situation. Like Amanda said, it may be just, you know, that there's the, the gully is not the problem, it's what causes the gully. And then you have to go upstream to sort of, or uphill from where that's occurring to figure out why that's occurring and why it's not stabilizing. And, and a lot of times it has to do with the volume of, of water flow. So mm -hmm. you got to correct that problem first and then you can start to re, you know, remediate the, the gully itself. Yes, that's great. And, and there are some folks out there that are, um, that can actually come out and take a look at that. If you're working with a consultant like Dave, uh, definitely contact them. Other options would be, you could contact your local county ranger and uh, try to get one of the foresters out there, try to get one of the water quality foresters that are available throughout the state to get them to maybe come take a look at that. Um, and that would be a free service. And that way they could kind of walk up the stream and at least give you an idea of whether or not it's going to be something that is going to take the help of someone else or some heavy equipment or someone else, someone with a more specialized skill or maybe even a hydrologist to look at how much water is really moving through there or an engineer. Um, some of the other options would be maybe NRCS. Uh, each county has a local NRCS office and they do have some, uh, I guess they could get you in touch with an engineer or a, a hydrologist as well. So there's other options there. And in certain counties, it may be with the local soil and water too. So there's would be two, several options there that would be a, a free service to check out as well. Okay, well, uh, it looks like we're coming close to three o'clock and I think we've gone through most of these questions and uh, you two have been great. We've beat you up with some random questions and uh, you both had wonderful presentations. So we appreciate you being here today and uh, we appreciate folks that have stayed on. We've had um, uh, several folks stay on, about 43 folks stay on and ask these questions. And it looks like they have, have waited to, to see what we could, to find the answers to their questions. So that's great. All right, so everybody that's out there, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to joining, coming into your, your home again soon uh, next month. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank Thanks, you, David. <laughs>